your album. I've been listening. Ah, that is my album. Yes. <laughs> Deeper than my roots. When is this album available? It's available now. Okay, well, there will be a purchasing link just below this video. Fantastic. Uh, I love the title "Deeper Than My Roots" and all the all the pictures on it. It feels to me as if it's uh, very autobiographical. Is that your intention with this record? Absolutely. I mean, it's all the influences that I grew up with uh, when I was a kid. You know, learning to play guitar and you know hearing the Beatles on the radio for the first time and having to actually bring my guitar up to the little transistor radio on Radio Luxembourg because at that time Radio One wouldn't play the Beatles. And I would listen for the new single and, um, yeah. and learn the chords that way. You know, unlike the way kids are able to do it now, they can listen to something over and over again. Uh, I guess that's what maybe showed me, the, taught me how to be reasonably quick at picking things up and spontaneous. But yeah, it's all about that. The album cover reflects uh, the different vinyl stuff that I loved in those days, like uh, Sergeant Pepper or the Incredible String Band who were massive influence on me in those days another scottish duo yeah. um so yeah it's all about that stuff that i grew up listening to and stuff that comes very natural to me um and albums that I, I love the album genre i love the idea of that which sadly is kind of getting lost these days um to to kids downloading you know maybe one track at a time and only buying one song instead of having to as we did i know i did when i was a young a young kid going into the local record shop and and looking through all the albums and having to pick one that i really could afford and one that i wanted to get and um yeah it's a different it's a different animal these days and that's fine in many ways although I, it's a shame because i feel that a lot of artists uh don't get a proper listening you know kids Absolutely. just buy one track uh, and that's it um but um I love the idea of, of, um, of people sharing in the listening of a, a complete work by a band, like in the old days when I, when I would listen to, to maybe Neil Young or, or Joni Mitchell um, or the Beatles or whoever, the New Stones record, you, you listen to the whole thing yeah. and you get into the whole atmosphere of the whole thing. And that's kind of what I wanted to create with this record was going back to that vibe uh, because it was all done fairly quickly in my own home in, in California. And then in the, in the in the home of a good friend of mine who has a who has a studio in his house, uh, Marlon Hoffman, where I did a lot of the recording. But it was done very much under those circumstances of okay, let's just record this track now. Let's put some guitars on it and add some more guitars, and I'll record some bass now. So it was all done very much very very free time, and yeah. it was a very enjoyable experience because I got to do it with my kids, yeah. uh, and they were they were very into it and. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I was able to grab them at that period in their lives and uh, and get them to, to do work on this record. So it's not only done from an old farts point of view, it's done with all these new kids, uh, young kids sensibilities. Well, you've kind of touched upon my next question with your with what you've just said. Uh, when I listen to this album, I hear lots of little sonic allusions to the, the history of popular music and perhaps how it affected you. For example, one look in your eyes is that fluty Mellotron sounding like Strawberry Fields. There's uh, a little bit at the start of You Lied to Me, which to my ears sounds like a nod to Unchained Melody. Final Quarter feels very Crosby, Stills and Nash. Uh, was that all intentional or am I barking completely up the wrong tree here? Uh, no, it wasn't intentional. What it was was essentially just the way that I am. It's, yeah. it's the music that I grew up with. So as you, as you rightly suggest, um, it does sound like many of those artists because that's this is what by calling the album deeper than my roots it was essentially saying this is the music that I grew up with and and more and beyond that so there's folk influences uh, from Scotland from when I started playing for example as I mentioned the incredible stream band and the Dubliners and Archie Fisher John Martin mm -hmm. uh, those artists that I loved when I was a kid and and grew up listening to and learning from. Uh, so yeah, it's all very much what it is. Uh, so in that way, it was kind of cathartic also for me to be able to get an album like that done, which was a nod to my favorite people. Um, and, um, you know, and then when I'm, when I'm finished with this, this tour with Elton, the Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour that we're on right now, when that's over a, a year from now, 
um, I'll be ready to, to go in and do my next one because I've already started writing for it. Uh, oh, when nice. I'm on the road traveling here, I, I take a, a, a travel guitar with me and a small amp and, and um, I write almost every day that I'm on the road. Uh, because that's inspired me. The, the album that I've just done has inspired me for, for what's coming in the future. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a, it's a beautifully melodic album as well. It's, you know, I enjoyed it the first time I, I heard it. If it's, oh, no. very, if it's very autobiographical, do you think uh, you might be sailing perilously close to concept album here? <laughs> well, I don't know if you'd call it a concept album, but maybe you can. Uh, I think it's just the fact that it's an album. Yeah. end of story um because um you know it does all hang together really well um yeah. because it was all written at one period apart from the two instrumentals on the album uh which were written back in uh 2012 uh there's a reason that, well there's several reasons that i put th those tracks on the album mainly because they sound great i'm very pleased with them uh but they also feature my old friend bob birch who sadly passed away later that year in 2012 and um you know um th those two tracks can they contain some of bob's amazing bass playing yeah. um but also um they just reminded me of things that, that i loved about i like to record quickly and spontaneously and that's also the way that elton works by the way so <clears throat> it's kind of like this is the way i do things i don't like to spend days weeks months on these things like a lot a lot of artists do and i'm not saying that's the wrong way i'm just saying i don't work that way myself i like to get the idea when it's most fresh get it down there and if there's a couple of mistakes on it i don't really care it's like i'd prefer to get the atmosphere of the moment on onto that recording uh, that tends to be what i what i go for and um yeah so i was very fortunate to be able to get those moments down you know, um, I won't say on vinyl because it's not on vinyl yet. It will be next year. Uh, we're going to do a vinyl package uh, release uh, sometime early next year before I come back to the to the UK for the, the final shows that we do with Elton. Yeah, I love the track Melting, Melting Snow. Um, what was the inspiration for that one? Well, it's a song about loss and about death. And, and one of my favorite uh, writers, of all time is Robert Burns. Okay. And he wrote an amazing uh, song called A Fond Kiss. I've actually stolen that, uh, that, that I put that in uh, part of the, the song, Melting Snow. Um, I'm very pleased with the way it came out because it is about loss and we've all had loss in our lives, you know. Uh, tragically, I've had suffered some very close tragedy uh, when we lost our, our son, Oliver, yes. back in 2001. Oh. Uh, when he was only nine years old. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I've, I have some experience uh, about losing a young one, which is really not a, a good thing for anybody. It shouldn't happen to any people. I, you know, to use a kid, to lose a kid is the most traumatic and tragic experience. And I've been able to survive that. And my oh. wife has. And the way we've survived that is by talking about Oliver every day. Uh, we discuss him and we, we celebrate his life rather than mourning his death. We Wonderful. celebrate his life. And, and uh, so, yeah, that, that was about him. And also uh, there's a nod to somebody else who, who we lost during uh, when I was writing that song, I became acquainted with a guy called Jimmy, the one mm -hmm. uh, who was a wonderful old character in, in Glasgow, who I was turned on to a friend of mine called Hugh. And, um, Jimmy passed actually the week that I was writing Melting Snow. Uh, so I, I decided to, to slip his name in there as well. But yeah, the songs about all kinds of stuff. The songs about, you know, you lied to me, which is essentially that's what it is. Although it's kind of a, a nod to, to torch songs that you might have heard in the, in the 1960s or 70s, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you lied to me, baby, kind of thing, you know. Uh, but actually, it's a song about Donald Trump. I wrote it about Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, you lied to me, motherfucker. That's basically what was it, what it was about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I think my subscribers would uh, rage at me if I didn't ask you about Elton John. Uh, um, interesting. I read the funeral for a friend was actually it was supposed to be a standalone uh, track on the Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album. How did it? Whose idea was it to kind of link it with Love Lies Bleeding, a song very much defined by your guitar sound? I must say. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, that was a. 
that was when we were really hitting on all cylinders with our band, you know, with Elton, myself, Dee Murray and Nigel Olsen. And then our producer being Gus Dudgeon, who I've known for many years and loved, uh, who sadly is no longer with us either. Uh, mm. But yeah, it was really Elton and Gus's idea when we came up with, when we, you know, as he was right, as we were writing Love Lies Bleeding, it was almost like, well, hold on a minute. That piece that we were writing, um, that little instrumental idea, it always was the idea that that would be the opening of the album. So really, again, because of the way we work, which is quite quickly, um, as soon as Elton was writing this, we thought, let's tag it on with this because of the title, Love Lies Bleeding. It seemed to fit really well with Funeral for a Friend. And then we asked our engineer on that record, uh, David Henschel himself, a wonderful musician who's still around to this day. And he composed the little, the very beginning part, the synthesized piece, uh, which is the intro to the whole thing. And when we put it all together, it just seemed to totally make sense. I think it was meant to be, you know, we were all, there was a stream of consciousness going uh, and we were writing in a certain vein back then. The ideas that we had suddenly were able to become a reality because we were all thinking the same, along the same lines. It's like when you hear all the young girls love Alice, for example, from that yeah. same Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album. Um, we were all thinking along those lines. So we were able to use special effects and different things because this is the way we were thinking. Uh, and again, you, you hark back to the 70s and Pink Floyd and different bands like that. You were able to do this kind of thing. Sure. It wasn't like you were stuck in one two and a half minute single you know, release. We were thinking in terms of, well, it doesn't matter how long it is because the longer the better, really. If people listen to our album, um, they'll get into the whole spirit of it by listening to this first track, which I don't know how long it is. It's something like nine minutes long, the whole thing or something. But that was beautiful because it was part of the way that many bands were recording back then or getting the chance to work that way because that's the way audiences were buying their music. And yeah. it was a wonderful period of time to be an artist where you knew that people would listen to the whole track. Yeah. I mean, your first Elton album you played on, as far as I understand, was uh, Mad Men Across the Water, which was about 52 right. years ago now. But uh, uh, my, my, my favourite Elton album is The uh, Tumbleweed Connection. Right. Uh, I'm just wondering what um, Elton John album that you contribute to are you most proud of? Wow, there's been a lot of them. I'm very fortunate to have played on a lot of them. Um, probably Yellow Brick Road and then yeah. a closely second would be Captain Fantastic mm -hmm. uh, and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, which is just a remarkable kind of autobiographical album story of Elton and Bernie's career. And and that was written, that was in 1974. So really, it was very early to do a, such an amazing uh, record. But, you know, I've got to say that, quite frankly, I contributed so much to all those albums that, that I, I feel very close to all of them. I mean, whether it's Honky Shad, well, Madman, obviously, because I was, I was brought in to play the signature guitar part on that because they, they had tried it with a couple of other players and they hadn't been able to find what it was they wanted and and when i walked in and they asked me to hear elton played me the, the intro to madman and he said but i want it to be on acoustic guitar what do you think and and i, I basically picked up my guitar and said well what about this yeah. and he went yeah that's what i was yeah. so you know i've been able to contribute to his music uh, all through the all through the decades i can say now which is quite startling really um but yeah even like honky chateau was a huge album because Rocket Man was Elton's first hit single, first number one hit single mm. um, um, for all of us. And it was an astonishing, it was really a, a, quite an amazing period in our lives as young, as young musicians because suddenly we had a number one record and we were doing what we wanted to do. So you got the best of both worlds. Right. Um, that was a remarkable feeling back then. So yeah, Honky Chateau meant a lot to me with Rocket Man. Uh, the next album, Don't Shoot Me, had Daniel on it, had Crocodile Rock. It had Have Mercy on the Criminal, which really was the first time that I stepped out in a big way as, a, as an electric guitar, you know, soloist with a, you know, to be reckoned with. And um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road with just all this wonderful stuff on it. And that was all just our band. Yeah. There's only a couple of tracks with um, anybody else on it. 
which at those times was Ray Cooper before he joined the band. He played a lot of percussion on it. And also um, um, Del Newman did some wonderful string arrangements. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've got to tell you, I loved all the albums that I've been involved in with Elton really, because we've had such a wonderful time making all those records. Um, you know, even Too Low for Zero, when we rejoined, uh, when we reformed uh, as, a, as a band, the original band in 82. Um, don't, I, you know, I guess that's why they call it the blues. It means a lot mm -hmm. to me, obviously, because I wrote it with mm -hmm. Elton and Bernie. But, um, you know, I'm still standing. All those, all those records were, it was like when we recorded them, we, made, we straight away, we knew we had something special. And it was like, you know, to, to know that you're recording something straight away, you go, oh, Christ, this is going to, I think this has got a good chance of being a, a big hit. And, and they were massive hits. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, not being blasé about it, but there's been a lot of, of, of albums. In fact, all of them, I think, that I feel that we did something kind of important as musicians at that time frame. And, and we got a chance to do it because we've built up a, a big fan base by all the touring we've done over the years. And that's starting to be very evident now, especially on this, this Farewell Yellow Brick Road tour, because the fans seem to be really loving it. And uh, it's a great feeling to be doing those songs to all these people, you know. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, I'm, I've got to ask you, because I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan. I'm just interested in... Uh... Um, from the inside out, uh, sorry, from the inside, sorry. How did you come to be involved with that? And do you have any interesting stories or anecdotes from working with Alice Cooper? Oh my God, I've got plenty. I've <laughs> got plenty you're not of them. Get sued for. Yeah, I've got, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of stories about Alice. Who I, I love Alice to this day. We're great friends. Alice and his wife Cheryl are the best people. And um, yeah, so when I've known Alice forever, and when Elton retired. Uh, which was the end of 1977, uh, famously in Wembley when he did that retirement speech when we were on stage playing. We had no idea he was going to do it, uh, but he did. And fine, that's what it was. So, um, so back in so 1978, by then I was just living loosely in LA, just getting used to being there and getting asked to do a lot of recording sessions with different people. And I'd known Alice uh, already for years. And I got a call from his manager, Shep Gordon, who's a wonderful person also and a great manager. Uh, and he said, Davey, look, you're not doing anything with Elton. Why don't you come and do a tour with Alice? He'd love you to play guitar for him. And my first reaction was, well, really? You know, you want me to come and play heavy metal guitar and wear makeup and all this kind of shit? And then I suddenly thought, you know what? That's going to be a great idea. You know, and I was still very young. I was still like 24 years old. And it was like, this could be great. And... Um, so I thought, yeah, why not? So uh, I did, uh, and Dee and I went along to listen to some of the music and he was recording from the inside, which was a really astounding record, which I really love that album. And um, I got a chance to, I got to play on a couple of tracks and I loved it mainly because Bernie had written these great lyrics along with Alice and David Foster, who produced the album and did some beautiful playing on it. But he was using these guys from a new band that was just being started to be formed called Toto. Okay. Now, those guys have become dear friends of mine, all of those guys. Um, some of the finest musicians that LA ever produced, that's for certain. Uh, Steve Lukather, Steve Piccaro, um, Jeff Piccaro, David Page. Toto was this band of astonishing musicians. And before they formed this band, they were doing all the sessions for, for people when they were like in their teens. They were like 18, 19 years old. So they were kind of like this image of me when I was first in London doing all the session work for all these other people. Um, and I got a chance to play with those guys. And I thought, wow, this is the future of, of contemporary music. So that was one aspect of the Alice thing that I love, that he was using those young guys and then I went on to, to do those tours with Alice. I, I did, God, I toured with him for a couple of years and then played on another album, Flush the Fashion, which was actually a very underrated album. Um, it came out at a very low point in Alice's career and life. And I don't think he'll mind me saying, but it was a low point for him. Um, I think but, he's um, too long to say he doesn't remember the album. Yeah, it was a very <laughs> tough period for him. 
and um, I thought there was some great stuff on it. And Roy Thomas Baker, who was a dear friend of mine from Queen, uh, you know, he produced <laughs> those phenomenal Queen albums. So he was producing the album and Roy and I had a wonderful time. And I brought a couple of songs to the album, one uh, called Clones, which did very well. Um, and then I co-wrote several of the songs on the album. It didn't do so well. As I say, Alice had, it was a period where things weren't great in his life. And happily, things got better again uh, in, in a couple of years down the road. And he went back to being the kind of Alice that people know him to be. And to this day, he's still doing tours, as you probably know. And his band is great. Um, they've got all these great players. Um, they got Ryan Roxy. They, they have Nina Strauss, the guitar player, uh, who's a startling, you know, soloist. And, and Alice is just happier than ever. I got to jam with him, actually, uh, just before COVID hit. We were in New Zealand together, me with Elton, obviously, and him on a tour. And, and his wife called me up and, Davey, what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, I'm on a night off. And why don't you come and see us play? And why don't you jam with us? And I was like, oh, really? So I went to see him play and came up i got up on stage for schools out and we had a real good laugh and it was fine it was fantastic so yeah i mean i've been very fortunate playing with people like alice and stevie nicks was somebody else who was great working with and we made a fabulous album with her called belladonna which probably her finest moment in her solo careers i think and john lennon as well you jammed with him john and i had the best time playing um and the best fun too i mean we we spent hours hanging out in, in the Plaza Hotel in New York, especially after the, the Madison Square Garden gig in 1974. Um, you know, Elton called me up after that show to say, wow, what a show that was. And, and he said, listen, John wants to come out over to your hotel and hang out with you. Is that OK? And I said, no, tell him to piss off. <laughs> and of course, then I said, don't be so stupid. Get him over here. Tell him to just come over right now. And, and John came over and and you know we hung out until about seven in the morning and having a wonderful you know reminiscing uh, reminiscing again i was this kid and i'm sitting there with an idol with john lennon we're talking about music and all kinds of stuff and, and um that was a wonderful period in our lives because john hung out with us that whole year he came to gigs with us and he flew out with us on the starship on our plane and we got to hang out with them he came to caribou ranch and we played, we did Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds together, which was a huge thrill. We played in New York together in the studio and live. And, you know, I've been so fortunate. If you think about the career I've had, not only with Elton, but to, to work with other people and to meet all these other great artists. So it's been something very special. Yeah, I bet. Anyway, I, I wish you the very best of luck with this wonderful new album. As I said, the purchasing link is just below. So do rush out and buy it. Uh, best of luck with the rest of the tour with Elton and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, sir. Lovely talking to you, by the way. Thanks for the great questions. Okay. My pleasure. My pleasure. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye for now.